Welcome to our 2023 Sustainability Fair. Um, we lasted this in 2019, and this event is an incredible partnership between Sustainable Saratoga and Skidmore College, so thank you, Kelsey, and all of our Sustainable Saratoga people for making this event possible. Um, along with the many organizations and people that are here as exhibitors, as workshop presenters, as people running kids' activities on our second floor of CASE, so thanks to the many people that made this event possible. Um, we're kicking off our event today with um, some music and, and words from Joe Bouchak, so I'm going to introduce Joe now. Writer, musician, and traditional storyteller, Joseph Bruchak is a citizen and member of the Elders Council of the Nolhagen Abenaki Nation. A best-selling author of over 180 books in several genres, his poems, essays, and stories have appeared in numerous anthologies and hundreds of magazines ranging from Aquasani Notes, Cricket, and Highlights for Children, to the Paris Review, Smithsonian, and National Geographic. His many honors include a New York State Arts Council Poetry Fellowship, a National Endowment for the Arts Writing Fellowship, a Rockefeller Foundation Fellowship, an American Book Award, the Virginia Hamilton Award, the National Education Association Civil Rights Award, the National Wildlife Federation Award, and the Lifetime Achievement Award from the Native Writer Circle of the Americas. In 2023, he was chosen as the first poet laureate of Saratoga Springs, New York. Thanks, Jeff.
since they were kind enough to give me a microphone, I will use it. And I also want to say, Willie O'Neill, sincerely give thanks, great thanks to everyone involved in this event, for what is done here is seriously important. We are always taught in our different native nations to think of seven generations to come. How will what we do now affect those seven generations from us? It's not just for ourselves that we are here. We are caretakers with this place, those who will follow after us. This is a new poem of mine called Earth Prayer. Because this earth is our first mother, we say, but see, what do you mean? Me not, tell me not. Great thanks again and again. Because all our ancestors could see the rain that falls, the air we breathe, the healing waters, the giving stones, our mother's blood, our mother's bones, our gifts that we have been given. It is from this earth that all our lives, those who came before us, those yet to come, like the seeds that sprout with each new spring, have grown, have grown, have grown. And what does this earth ask of us? All that it needs is that we never take too much. Always remember to give back in equal measure for those gifts we may take for granted. And also remember that we must walk with care, always show kindness to all of those now here with us, sharing gifts of light and life. Never forget those who share our breath, two-legged, four-legged, those with wings, those who swim, dig into the soil from the greatest to those too small to see, are all related, one and all, what a the whole, oh God, all our relations. So as we continue on this circle, which has no beginning and no end, let us all say to our Mother Earth, you see, what do you mean? Me not, talk me not. Great thanks again and again. Thank you so much, Joe. Hi, everyone. Thank you for joining us today. My name is Kelsey Trudell. I'm the Executive Director of Sustainable Saratoga. I would now like to introduce Jen Kretzer and Elodie Link from the Wild Center for our keynote address. As Director of Climate Initiatives, Jen leads the Wild Center's climate change engagement programs, including the Global Youth Climate Program, which was highlighted by the Obama White House Office of Science and Technology. In 2021, she led the Wild Center's youth climate delegation at the UN COP26 Climate Conference in Scotland. Jen serves on Climate Literacy Energy Awareness Network, the U.S. Action for Climate Empowerment Coordinating Team, is a board member of the Adirondack Mountain Club and a core team of the Adirondack Diversity Initiative. Elodie spreads youth climate summits around the world and supports youth in her goals, in their goals to take climate action in their schools and communities as the Jeannie Hutch Hutchins Youth Climate Coordinator. In 2021, Elodie attended the TED Countdown Summit in Scotland and managed communications for the Wild Center's youth delegation at COP26. She graduated from Skidmore College in 2021 with a BA in Political Science and Dance and Performance Choreography. At Skidmore, Elodie worked in the Sustainability Office and developed the College's Environmental Justice Resource Guide. Thank you both for all your hard work and dedication to sustainability and climate action. Thank you so much. Hi, everybody. Is uh, my mic working OK? Can everyone hear me? Awesome. Thank you. Um, again, my name is Jen Kretzer, and I'm the Director of Climate Initiatives at the Wild Center. I use she, her pronouns. And we're so thrilled to be here today, and I'm going to let my uh, colleague introduce herself. Um, hi, I'm Elodie. Um, I'm the Youth Climate Coordinator at the Wild Center, and I also use she, her pronouns, and I'm excited to be here today. Thank you. So we're going to just jump right in. Uh, we're from the Wild Center, about a couple hours north of here. How many of you have been to the Wild Center before or heard about the Wild Center? Okay, awesome. That's great. We're at about 50%. Um, you're now all officially invited to come see us. We'll be sharing a little bit about our events towards the end of the talk today. Um, but we are a science museum. Uh, our mission is to ignite an enduring passion for the Adirondacks, where people and nature can thrive together and offer an example for the world. I think of us as a bit of a mashup between a science center, a nature center, and an aquarium. We're really focused on connecting people to nature in the Adirondacks and throughout the northern forests. Uh, and we have lots of different exhibits, uh, training trips on the Rapid River, um, movies, um, in, in live animals. And this past year, we opened up our brand new climate solution 
students exhibit, which is appropriate since we're talking about climate solutions today. So I wanted to just highlight that and again invite all of you here. So we are going to talk about climate change. And because both Elodie and I are educators, uh, we wanted to make this a little bit interactive. So we're actually going to start with an icebreaker to get you all talking about climate change. So what I'd like you to do is actually to find a partner or a little group right next to you. So you can um, do that right now if you came by yourself. I want you to find a new friend. You can introduce yourself if you haven't met before or chat with the people behind you or in front of you. Everybody got someone they're going to talk with? So for the next couple minutes, we'd like you to talk about what is something you have heard about climate change that has stuck with you. It turns out that even though 76% of Americans, and this is across all political spectrums, know that climate change is happening and believe that it's happening, the thing that we don't do is that we don't talk about it. And so the first thing we wanted to get you all doing is actually talking about it. So we're halfway, halfway through our solutions right now. It's just getting everybody to start talking about it a little bit more. So what is it that we really need to know about climate change? So we're going to set this up. So I'm going to talk a little bit about the science and impacts of climate change, which is kind of the wah wah part of everything, right? Um, but then I'm going to hand it off to Elodie, and she's going to share with you more about the solutions um, and, and leave us on a note feeling optimistic and hopeful. Uh, it's real. It's happening. It's us. It's urgent. But we have the solutions at hand, and we can all make a difference. So if we can remember we know that these things are true, it will go a long way for us shifting our frame and understanding that we do have the solutions at hand and that we can all make a difference. So first of all, I want to make sure that we're all on the same page as to weather and climate versus climate. And I know many of you are probably studying this, so this is back to the basics. Just bear with me for a couple seconds. Um, so weather is like what it looks like outside today. It's hot and sunny. But climate is that long-term trend. So sometimes I like to think about it when we're talking with our youth. It's like you think about weather as like the outfit you chose today. You can think about climate as your entire wardrobe, including all those boxes you have hidden in your garage. Like so that's you want to think about that long-term <coughs> trend. Um, that's climate change. So that's what we're thinking about, and that's what we understand and know that it is warming. So 97% of scientists believe that it's warming. And then you're like, oh, what about the 3%? Well, as it turns out, Dr. Katherine Hayhoe is this amazing, who's heard of Dr. Katherine Hayhoe? She's an amazing climate scientist based out of Texas. She's now actually the lead climate scientist for the Nature Conservancy. She wrote a book called Saving Us. She's got an amazing YouTube channel called Global Weirding. She actually went in and looked at that 3% and was like, yeah, a lot of this data is cherry picked and, and really debunked it. So we're actually a lot closer to 100% of climate experts understand that humans are changing the global temperature. Where is that coming from? So for us, um, you know, as many of you know, we, carbon dioxide is the big greenhouse gas, but we also have these other uh, ones like methane, methane and nitrous oxides. But across the U.S., generally, sometimes it's very state to state, we can look at these sectors, and these big three here, electricity, transportation, and industry, is the bulk of where our greenhouse gases are being admitted. And when they're admitted into the atmosphere, as we know, um, the atmosphere is, is their heat trapping gases, so they're holding that heat closer to the earth. So it's like if you keep putting on blankets on a warm day and you're wrapping yourself up, that's what the earth, that's what's happening right now with the earth and greenhouse gases. We know that it's happening and we know that climate change is super urgent. So um, the newest IPCC report um, is has that just came out not that long ago has stated that the 2.7 that limiting ourselves to 2.7 degrees Fahrenheit or 1.5 degrees centigrade would require rapid and far-reaching unprecedented changes in all aspects of society. We have a closing window and gap that we need to work through pretty much the next 10 years, which is you know which just can be a little bit. Um, hard to wrap our brains around. And we need to have a quick and radical shift away from fossil fuels to keep us um, below that 2.7 degrees Fahrenheit. And we're already seeing impacts of on folks that have contributed the least that are experiencing the worst. So I want to pause on that one just for a second. We know that climate change impacts, which I'm going to talk a little bit more about in just a minute, are 
deeply disproportionate on black, indigenous, and people of color communities. And that also includes youth and the elderly are also considered marginalized. So we know that those folks that have the least to do with climate change um, impacts also are experiencing the worst. And we also know that the UN um, Secretary demanded that developing nations fully decarbonize by 2040, which is a decade earlier than other nations. So um, Western countries like ourselves and most of Europe, we know that we need to work faster and harder than those, many of those countries in the global south. And you're probably like, oh, does a few degrees make a big difference? 2.7 degrees Fahrenheit, that doesn't sound like a lot. Well, just ask any working parent that any tiny increase in temperature can have devastating consequences. And this is true, I mean, even here in the Northeast, the warming is, a, is, is not uh, equal, um, but in the Northeast, we've actually warmed seven degrees. We're warming more here than we are in any other part of the contiguous US, um, and particularly in winter. And if this trend continues in 2100, New York State's climate will be similar to that of the current Richmond, Virginia. So you can see from this model, with higher emissions in orange and the lower emissions in yellow, that we are shifting, our climate is shifting. So what is happening in New York State? So we're gonna drill down just a little bit on, on some of these big impacts. So most of our, our cultural identity is grounded in the seasonal changes that we experience. I know being from the Adirondacks that I really, really have a strong cultural identity around winter and our communities such as this one right here, Serenic Lake where I'm from, um, we have winter festivals like our winter carnival, skiing, snowmobiling, ice fishing are all part of our local traditions. And changing seasons are affecting our world ecosystems, environments, and co economies. That includes you know, much of New York State has an agriculture, is in, works in agriculture. We need to be thinking about how climate change is already impacting it and what we're going to do to adapt and mitigate it. We know we're seeing warmer summers, milder winters, an increase in heat days, and that some places will have an average increase of 12 degrees by 2100. In terms of precipitation, and this includes all types of precipitation, we're see we are seeing that increase in rainfall, um, less snowpack. I know this year in the Adirondacks, and we've been experiencing this for a while, is that decrease in snowfall and um, the ability to enjoy many of our winter sports, but also to recharge and replenish our streams and aquifers. Uh, we see an increase in extreme storm and an increase in droughts. We also know that um, there are changing or long our, that there's changing coastal and ocean habitats. That we're seeing ocean acidification and sea level rise, which affects ecosystem services and livelihoods. We know that oceans are warming and that our shorelines are rising at 1.2 inches per decade. Which again, does it sound like a lot? But it but it is. It can be exponential when we think about storms such as. Uh, Hurricane Sandy or Superstorm Sandy. We also need to think about how we're maintaining urban areas and their interconnectedness. Our infrastructure, if you look across the, the northern, the northeast seaboard, we really see those connected economies um, through our transportation and infrastructure, and that climate change is already having an impact on those, and we need to be thinking again ahead on how we can best adapt and mitigate that. One of the biggest things is the threat to human health. How many of you know someone that either that has asthma or maybe has a tick-borne illness such as Lyme's disease? Yeah, you know, where I grew up in the Adirondacks, like we never worried about ticks. I grew up playing up in the fields behind my parents' house, and we never ever saw ticks. But now we have to check every single time, and it's becoming more and more prevalent. And those heat-borne, um, I'm sorry, the um, the, those threats to human health, again, are particularly disproportionate on communities of, of color, indigenous communities, and uh, youth and the elderly. So all that news makes me want to do this. To curl, up, to curl up in a little ball and be like, oh my gosh, the gloom and doom factor is high. What are we going to possibly do about it? And that's hard to take. It's hard to understand, like, who am I as one person to influence and do something around climate change. Well, first I'd like us all to take a deep breath, so let's try to do this together. One more. 
we are not going to do this. We are not going to curl up in the ball, not at least in the uh, long term. We are going to fight solutions. And I'm going to turn it over to Elodie now, and she's going to um, tell us a bit more about how exactly we're going to get ourselves out of this mess. Yeah. Thanks, Jen. Um, yeah, I know it's hard to talk about the impacts. It's hard to talk about the science. It can be really overwhelming and intimidating. Um, and while it's important to have a basic understanding of what's happening and who it's affecting, um, it's even more important at this, at this point in time to think about the solutions that we have, the solutions that you're passionate about implementing, um, and how we can actually do that. Um, it's important to note that we do have all the solutions that we need to address the climate crisis. They exist. We don't need some sort of crazy new in invention. That it's not a bad thing, but we have what we need. We just need to scale it up. They need to happen more quickly, they need to happen all over the world, and they need to happen at as big a scale as humanly possible. So to start us off on a positive note, um, New York State's Climate Act is one of the most ambitious climate laws in the entire nation. So we are in a good spot to be here in New York State. Um, it is going to require New York to reduce economy-wide greenhouse gas emissions 40% by 2030, which is very soon, um, and no less than 85% by 2050 from 1990 levels. So this is good news. We can celebrate, we can celebrate this. So talking about solutions can be really overwhelming. There's a lot out there. I like to use Project Drawdown, um, especially uh, if it's if solutions feel particularly overwhelming to folks. Um, the concept drawdown is that a point in the future when levels of greenhouse gases in the atmosphere stop climbing and start to steadily decline, halting catastrophic climate change as quickly, safely, and equitably as possible. So this book um, is incredible. It outlines, it outlines 100 of the most effective climate solutions that we have, and it ranks them from the, from the solutions that will make the biggest impact to the, uh, to the solutions that might make a slightly smaller impact but are still really important. And it's super comprehensive and super organized, so I would strongly recommend taking a look at this, but we're gonna use this framework a little bit today. So this is similar to what Jen was talking about earlier when we talk about the sources of where our emissions are coming from. And you can see here the different colors. Um, we have electricity, food, agriculture, land, industry, transportation, buildings, and then this sort of other category. So that's what's coming up into the atmosphere. That's what we are emitting. Um, and then carbon sinks. Who knows what a carbon sink is? Yes. Okay. Um, I guess it's where it traps the carbon dioxide trap in the ocean or the Exactly. Exactly. Yes. So it is a system that sucks down the carbon that's in the atmosphere and stores it. So we have land sinks like forests or bogs, and then uh, coastal and ocean sinks. Um, so what we need to do is we need to limit what's coming up support what can suck it back down, yeah? And we have this fun little 59% here. 59% of this isn't coming back down, and that's why we have global warming. So this is sort of a solutions lens of the graph I just showed you from Project Drawdown, and it breaks down the sort of general broad solutions within all of these categories. So in electricity, we have shifting production and enhancing uh, efficiency. So if we're using Skidmore as an example, how can Skidmore shift our reliance on fossil fuels towards reliance on renewable sources? So upping our geothermal and solar and all of these things uh, so that the majority of our energy, ideally all of our energy, will be coming from renewable sources. But in the meantime, while that takes a while to happen, how can we make sure that we are using our electricity as efficiently as possible um, in our buildings and, and everywhere else? So we're not wasting what we are having to use. Food, agriculture and land, uh, diets, ecosystems, agricultural practices. How are we thinking about the dining hall? Are we able to begin composting? Where are we getting our food from? Is it local? Um, all things that, that Skidmore can consider as well. Industry, randomly, refrigerants is one of the largest climate solutions that we have. It's ranked number one um, in Drawdown. So, refrigerants, I guess. Um, transportation, maybe Skidmore can have an all-electric fleet of campus safety vehicles, um, right? So enhancing efficiency, electrifying vehicles, and shifting to alternatives as well. Then buildings, similar to electricity here, enhancing efficiency and shifting our sources. And here we have a little bit more about carbon sinks, like we mentioned before. 
for. And remembering that we also need to talk about the societal implications here. Climate change is a very scientific issue, but it's also a very human issue. And centering equity, health, and education are essential to transitioning to a renewable economy um, in the best way possible. So now we're going to do uh, the climate action pro action process together. Only a little snippet, just to get started. Um, but climate action planning can help people um, find agency and think about the problems that they see in their communities and how they might want to take action on that. So these are just a couple of examples of some of the amazing things that are. Uh, the youth that we work with have, have done. Um, you obviously don't need to do these things, but it's just kind of cool to look at the wide variety of amazing projects that young people have completed after attending these climate summits and going through this climate action planning process. So we have climate action plans, um, and we're going to pass them out. Um, so if you came here with a group of friends, colleagues, peers, whatnot, I would encourage you to work as a group, just because climate action plans are easier to implement for more than one person. But if you came alone or would rather work individually, that is fine too. Um, but basically, it gives you an opportunity to brainstorm, sort of like this fun Venn diagram idea. What do I care about? What are the issues that I'm seeing? What category might that fit in? And then start making some goals. Yeah, what are some goals for how I can get started short term and long term? What are, who are the people and the resources in the community that I need to be in contact with to make this happen? Uh, all these different questions, you'll see. Uh, so Jen and I can walk around and answer any questions. We're just gonna take about five minutes just to get the process started. Uh, and hopefully you can walk out of here and even with just a sprinkle of an idea of something that you could do back home. Some resources. We won't read through all of these. Um, please come find us at our booth after. Um, but we have a toolkit for starting the Youth Climate Summit for working for adult allies, working with young people, a news flash, social media, newsletter, a uh, network of people who are planning summits all over the world that can come together and support each other uh, while they're working on that. Um, okay, and I'm gonna hand it over to Jen, who's gonna sure. talk over. Thank you. Um, so we already mentioned All We Can Save, which is a great project. In addition to All We Can Save, I also had mentioned um, Dr. Catherine Hayhoe, um, and her program, Global Weirding, which is a free program on YouTube. You can also uh, find her book, Saving Us, which is amazing. And she's got tons of talks and stuff. She's super positive and, and really has a great approach. Um, Action for the Climate Emergency is a national organization that works with young people across the US to um, mobilize voter registration. They also have a ton of resources and videos and um, Curriculum. So if you're in the education space, this is a great resource for you. Um, Yale Climate Connections, I can't recommend this enough. Stay up to date with all the climate resources. They have a great newsletter that comes out every week. Uh, they have the Yale Climate Opinion Map, so you can like delve down, like, you know, look at your county and see what people are thinking about climate change or look at it across the nation. So there's so much good, great resources through Yale, and then also to reiterate the fact that we live in a state that's super aggressive on climate change, and that we have um, this incredible climate, the Climate Act, which is this new law that went into effect this past year. There's gonna be a lot of incentives coming down to think about getting heat, heat pumps for your home, to buying an EV. So I really encourage you to, to delve deep into that uh, particular uh, website and to look more into what's available here in Saratoga or wherever you're from. Finally, I wanted to mention all the great events happening at the Wild Center this coming um, summer. Um, so we have a huge number of teacher and or educator events along with youth and public events. So starting on May 20th, we have a free uh, full day uh, educator workshop supporting students in nature-based learning, which is a partnership between the Wild Center and Cornell Lab of Ornithology. That's a Saturday in May free. July 1st is our Get Outside Festival, right at the museum, great public family event. Um, the 12th through the 14th are Climate Change Educator Retreat, so this is an in-person retreat uh, at, in the Finger Lakes. Um, so this year we're partnered with uh, the Finger Lakes Institute at Hobart and William Smith Colleges, and it's right on the lake, it's gonna be incredible. We also, the following week, have our Summer Institute for Climate Change Education. This is a virtual, so it's open to anybody anywhere in the world. We partner with uh, the NOAA Climate Program Office and also an organization called Climate Generation out in Minnesota. Um, 
bringing together about three to 400 educators for a really, and you're like, oh my God, Zoom, I can't stand it. But it's actually, it's an amazing program, and, you'll, and it's, you won't even realize you're on Zoom when you're on Zoom. Um, and then finally, well, not quite finally, but the 31st to the 3rd, our Youth um, Climate Leadership Retreat open to high school students from across New York State that will be at the Wild Center. And on August 5th, our Plug-In Festival, which is very similar to what's happening here today, so we can't wait to get out and meet all the vendors and meet many of you that are, that are here and invite you to join us at our festival at the museum. And finally, we'll move to questions. We thank you so much for your patience and participation in our program today. Happy Sustainability Fair, happy Earth Week. It's our favorite time of year. Um, but thank you again for having us. We're happy to entertain any questions.